Dennis Chang here feeling a little bit uh, discouraged I just filmed this entire video and realized there was some problem with the interface and the audio was all screwed up <laughs> so here we go again today's video is a continuation of last week's video where we talked about playing over up tempo songs and we talked about keeping up with set tempo depending on how act one actually defines up tempo this can be quite difficult to do because, as I said, the guitar is just not an ideal instrument for playing intricate jazz lines at high speeds. Before we start, I'd like to thank JES International for supplying me with this amazing Godan guitar for my entire stay here in Japan. I'll be leaving Japan next week, so sad. JES International is the official sponsor, and not sponsor, <laughs> distributor for Godan guitars, Tom Anderson guitars, Phil Jones Amplification and a number of other brands. Um, if you ever find yourself in Nagoya, Japan, be sure to uh, visit their offices because they have recording studios, music school, and they're really, really amazing people. And as always, I would really appreciate if you could like, comment, subscribe, share, or something, because it makes a huge, huge difference for me. Um, because of the pandemic, my livelihood is now just doing these YouTube videos and DC Music School and Sound Slice. So every little bit helps a lot. I thank those of you who have supported me thus far. And <laughs> right now my mind is in a dark place because this is the second time I'm doing this video today. Hopefully it'll go faster. I managed to make a little bit of money from the YouTube advertisement. But if you really want to support me, you can try it. You can consider buying my music on Bandcamp. Or you can check out Sound Slice, where I've made courses on beginner gypsy jazz guitar, bebop, phrasing, and there's a harmony course that I'm really, really proud of. Uh, of course, there's also DC Music School, and you'll find all the links in the description box. So thank you, thank you so much to those who contribute to my livelihood. All right, let's get started. Quick recap. So basically, what I mentioned last week is that these heavy metal shredders they have these lines that they play and they have it down to a very specific science because they're taking advantage of a number of hacks. Very specific fingerings, specific picking patterns, specific mechanics, whatnot. Um, that's why they're able to play at light speed. And that's also why you rarely hear jazz players playing that fast. It is because jazz lines, for the most part, are nowhere that simple. Think about it. If jazz lines were as simple as 1, 2, 3, 4, I could probably play 16th notes, 200 BPM. Yeah, jazz. Hey, guess where that's from? If you know it, you're cool. Or if you had like a sweep pattern like this. Yay, I can play 16th notes of what I don't know what this was, 250 BPM. If only jazz were that simple. The truth is, bebop or gypsy jazz lines are nothing like that for the most part. Many jazz lines are not even guitaristic in nature. They are often lines that are played across various instruments. Horns, piano, bagpipes, whatever. The ones that guitarists manage to play fast are usually the ones that are more guitaristic in nature. For instance, me personally, I've learned a lot from horn players and pianists, but what I've also done was change a few things here and there to make them easier to play. While I did say last week we had to be efficient with our technique, there's one thing I didn't really specifically mention. Is that I personally have a fairly heavy picking hand because I come from an acoustic background. I have a technique that is based on fairly heavy articulation. I also mentioned that a lot of jazz lines often have accents in fairly weird places. And at slower tempos, while I do play with dynamics, I often also use a lot of slurs um, starting on offbeats, and especially when I go faster. At slower tempos, 
I may choose to pick every note or I may decide to put a slur here and there. It's not something that's very calculated. It's felt in the moment because I have a lot of experience hearing how certain lines should sound. The point I want to, to make is that the faster I go, the more likely I may rely on these slurs and the more likely I, might, I may have to lighten my right hand attack so that I may not be accenting as much as I did when it was, if it was slower. If you watch a lot of uh, players playing like shreddy jazz lines, they tend to rely a lot on legato and tend to have a fairly light attack. Basically, the faster you go, the more you're likely to have to sacrifice some level of articulation. And it doesn't matter who you are. Of course, there are some beasts out there whose threshold for sacrifice is much higher than the average musician. But by and large, it doesn't matter who you are, sacrifices have to be made. There's a video of Barney Kessel and Herb Ellis playing super fast rhythm changes. It's uh, the Flintstones theme. Now, please don't assume that I'm criticizing them. I am not. But I'm just using these examples to show how difficult it really is to play fast jazz guitar, even for the best players. But let's just be honest. Their ideas are amazing, but from a technical point of view, they clearly struggle. It's just that hard. In terms of pure execution, Herb Ellis does a little bit better than Barney Kessel. Why is that? Is it because he has better technique? Not necessarily. It's because if you watch or listen to what he's doing, he's playing a lot of guitaristic lines and he's even doing a lot of repetitive figures like heavy metal shredders. Barney Kessel, on the other hand, is actually trying to play all his typical bebop lines, but those lines are so intricate, as I said in the last week's video, that his right and left hands are simply have, are having a lot of trouble coordinating. If I or any other guitar player were to play the, the same lines at the same speed, we'd struggle too. Probably the only way to play those lines, if even possible, would be to completely rework the lines with different fingers, uh, fingerings, maybe even different techniques, maybe even more legato, who knows. The problem is that if you do that, it becomes less of a work, less of an improvised solo and more of a worked out solo. Barney is obviously playing in the moment using all his standard fingerings. So as a contrast to that example, there's a video of a Dutch uh, jazz guitarist playing a solo on Just Friends on YouTube. He's, it's a note for note cover of Oscar Peterson's solo, which is really, really fast. And he nails it. But here's the thing, everything is calculated like a classical etude. You look at his left hand fingerings, they're very worked out, like shredder fingerings. Because first of all, it's a piano solo, like I said, it's not necessarily guitaristic in nature. And he adopts this kind of hand position and these sweep techniques and everything to, like all these little hacks to be able to execute everything. This is very unlikely in real life improvisation in the moment situations. Most jazz guitar players adopt this kind of position as opposed to this because it gives us a better, better grip for certain things at the expense of efficiency. As opposed to... Another example, there's a video of John McLaughlin playing Cherokee with a big band at a fairly high tempo. And he actually manages to keep up with uh, the tempo without sacrificing too much in terms of execution. Why is that? Because he's not playing bebop lines. He's playing John McLaughlin lines. A lot of his lines are quite similar to the shred lines. So my whole video last week and what I just mentioned was just to get you guys to be aware of this reality. Once you are aware of this, then it's up to you to decide how you want to play, what your musical goals are, what kind of lines you might want to play. It's something that you have to decide for yourself. And then if you're going to play over up-tempo songs and try to keep up with the tempo, you have to be very careful about what kind of, which kind of lines you're going to want to practice. And the only way to know which lines will work would be to try it yourself, the, the fast, the up-tempo thing. 
and then with your own intuition you have to do you have to figure out for yourself which lines might potentially work with your technique if you practice hard enough yes your technique because we each have our own technique myself as i mentioned last week i have three different techniques and depending on the technique i use i may change the fingerings here and there to to take adva to better advantage of my right hand technique but efficiency only matters if we want to play quite fast furthermore how often does it happen that we really play super up tempo songs and then when we do as i hinted last week keeping up with the tempo is but one approach that you can take and often it is going to be a mix of approaches and this is what we're going to talk about today last week i talked about jim hall and louis armstrong and there's also django reinhardt i want you to listen to jim hall with sonny rollins playing over a fast rhythm changes it's a video called the bridge watch that video and if Jim Hall, who is a legend of jazz guitar, is known for anything, it's definitely not his technique. But if you watch the video, you will see that not only does he play very well, it's almost effortless for him. All this without shredding. Watch Louis Armstrong play over Tiger Rag from the early 1930s. Listen to Django Reinhardt. He has a song called uh, Django Rag. It's with a big band from the early 1940s. It starts off slow, then it becomes super fast. And maybe also listen to Angelo Dabar, his recording of Sheik of Araby from his album Gypsy Guitars. And actually this recording is one that I like because it's very varied in terms of approaches. So last week we talked about keeping up with the tempo. That's one approach. Now we're going to talk about two other approaches. The first one is the halftime approach. I'll count slowly, but if the tempo is 1, 2, 3, 4, 1, 2, 3, 4, 1, 2, 3, 4... You feel this instead and when you feel that you can then try to start to experiment with quarter note based phrases so so those were quarter notes but i'm just feeling one two three four and if you want to change the, the character of it, you can swing the quarter notes. And that's something that's quite typical in the Louis Armstrong era. You can also add triplets instead of quarter notes. Django was a master of this, and uh, Angelo Debar also was a is really really good at this. I think Django might have gotten this from Louis Armstrong. If you check out uh, a recording from Louis Armstrong over the tune uh, Dinah, I think it's from 1933. Over the B section, it's kind of fast tempo, but Louis is feeling just the halftime feel. And has that, what do you call, uh, swung quarter notes. Dun, da, da, ba, de, da, da. You can hear some of this in Jim Hall's playing as well. Like the triplet, the halftime feel, I mean. So how can you practice this? This is not something that I do, but one idea uh, is if, if it's very difficult for you to concentrate because the rhythm section is just too um, frantic for you, what you can do if you can record yourself is to record everything at half tempo with half duration of the chords. So if we're talking about uh, Donnelly, instead of doing... And you practice over that. And if you manage to do it pretty well, and you record yourself, you take that solo, you copy and paste it over the actual tempo, and then you create that effect. For those of you who are gypsy jazz players, one thing that I did um, with Angelo Dabar for DC Music School in the later volumes, I forget the, the like the last two or three volumes that I did with them with a black backdrop, is I purposely had him play over a lot of uh, up-tempo songs so that it brings out that side of his playing. You'll notice that sometimes he's shredding, but sometimes he's doing the halftime thing with triplets or quarter notes. And that's why I really like that Sheik of Araby recording that I mentioned from his album uh, Gypsy Guitars. It's very, very varied in terms of approaches. Sometimes he's playing in tempo, sometimes it's halftime with that triplet thing. It's a really, really good solo. And playing, thinking in terms of quarter notes is great because it allows us, it's a good way for us to transition from one approach to the other. Because playing 
when I mean quarter notes, I mean quarter notes at the full tempo. But when it's at half time, it ends up being eighth notes. So it has that figure in common between the two feels. And when you listen to Angelo Debar uh, transitioning between the different approaches, he often uses quarter notes to bridge between the two, the two approaches. Angelo is really a master of this. And um, it's how he manages to play for extended periods of time without ever getting tired. In fact, the faster it is, the more he feels relaxed. The one that's going to have a hard time is the rhythm player. <laughs> the next approach is what I call the, the floating approach. You still play rhythmically, but according to your personal internal clock. So it doesn't have to actually match the tempo of the rhythm section. Uh, players who do this are Ulf Vakenius, uh, Pat Martino, and actually a lot, a lot of bebop players believe it or not, because it's a spectrum. It doesn't necessarily mean like super floaty. Sometimes it can be very close to playing in tempo, but with a slightly relaxed feel that if we were just to casually listen, we wouldn't know that it was floating until we actually sat down and transcribed everything. The floating thing can also be done in over medium tempo songs as well. When a lot of players are shredding, they're not necessarily doing double time. They're doing, they, they may be doing double time, but sometimes they're also floating. But here's the thing, just because you're floating doesn't mean you're ignoring what the rhythm section is doing. And this is exactly what I did in the second half of my Donnelly solo for you. This is a nightmare to transcribe. When you transcribe it, like it's, it's often a mess and you often have to quantize it to a certain extent. Someone out there transcribed a solo of Tal Farlow shredding over Cherokee. But if you slow down the recording to 25%, you hear that the rhythms, uh, the rhythms, sorry, don't always exactly match the transcription. There's quite a little bit of floating. So you see, this is the reality that guitarists face. The guitar is just not a shredding instrument when it comes to bebop lines. But this floating thing isn't as easy as it seems. Like I said, um, you have to be listening. You have to listen very carefully to the rhythm section while ignoring it. Regardless, I should also say the most important thing is that the rhythm section has to be really tight, really good. And they also have to play in a very clear way so as to help the soloist. There's nothing worse than a bad rhythm section. I've been at jam sessions where often it was the drummer who initiated a super fast tempo and they started shredding from the get-go. They're playing over everyone, putting accents in all the weird places. So the person that's actually supposed to be soloing is getting nervous because the accents are on all sorts of weird places. It doesn't matter if the, the drummer is playing in time, but you put accents like all, all sorts of weird places. It's hard to keep track of where you are. If you have bass players doing polyrhythms and then playing all sorts of substitutes, it adds to the stress. If you have a piano player that's all over the place or it, it's just, it's a nightmare. And I have a funny story. I once went to a concert, it was a quartet, two guitar players, drums and bass. One of the guitar players is one of the world's maybe top three, top five jazz guitar players, a legend, a living legend. And he was playing with a local band somewhere on this planet. And I, I, I'll never forget this. They were actually playing Cherokee, super, super fast. The first soloist was the other guitar player. Played well, played a really good solo. Uh, the, the famous player did, his, did the comping. Okay. And then when it was the famous soloist turned to solo, the other guitar player just completely laid out, didn't comp at all. And it was super fast. <laughs> this is really hilarious. I could see how pissed off the famous player was getting. He was kind of turning red. And I was sitting like maybe just a few feet away from him. I was in front, so I could actually hear him saying, Comp, 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 comp. <laughs> Think about that. A legend, like, a guitar player that everyone on this planet respects and loves feeling stressed out because he wasn't getting the support that he needed to be able to play comfortably. The bass player and the drummer were good, but having the guitar comp in a good way would, would have made it so much easier. It would have made it easier for me too. So speaking of Cherokee, if you listen to that tall follow recording, the bass player is playing clear lines, the drummer is playing super simple and putting all the accents in the right places. So that the bass and drums are rel quite tight together and the, the drummer would accent at all the right places like uh, the beginning of the, 
the form or going to the B section, going back to the A section. That's, that's perfect. And then the piano player played super clear chords, simple rhythms, but very effective. I could hear that like Tal is relying a lot on the piano player to, to kind of keep up with where, where he is in the form. So yes, a good rhythm section makes a huge, huge difference. The super tight rhythm section is especially important if you want to do the Louis Armstrong halftime feel for obvious reasons. For swing music, it also helps if the, the bass player is playing in a two feel with fairly strong accents, so you have a clear pulse to hang on to. Anyway, for the floating thing, you choose how fast you want to play, what kind of rhythmic figures you want to use. But basically, I'm still playing to some kind of invisible pulse within my body while listening to the rhythm section and ignoring it. It's kind of weird, and it's not as easy as it seems. If there's a good pianist doing something like what uh, the pianist for Tal was doing, I'm often listening to that to determine where I am, to keep track of where I am, or I listen for cues from the drummers with well-placed accents. I mean, I listen to all the instruments, and if, if everyone is doing like a good job, then playing at 350 BPM isn't necessarily too difficult. You can still play kind of fast, where it almost sounds like you're playing in tempo, like eighth notes or triplets or whatever, but when you transcribe, like I said, it's a huge mess. It just depends on how much you want to float. There's a high degree of flexibility. But like I said, when you look at transcriptions, they're often quantized. As an exercise, maybe what you can do is you can try to transcribe the Tal Farlow solo for yourself, write it down, and then compare it to the, the transcription online that's available. And, and you'll probably realize you're going to have some differences here and there. And it's, it's, it's very normal that there's some level of floating involved at this tempo. When I had to transcribe a lot of bebop players like B. Red Legren, I was also the official transcriber for Andres Orberg's online music academy at some point. Uh, I remember Andres would send me these tracks, hey, can you transcribe this? I just listened to it, oh, it seems pretty easy, it's like eighth note based. And then after when I actually transcribe it, it's like, ooh, his phrasing is eighth note based, but it's not, it's floating. And then I have to make these choices, these choices to make the notation readable. One thing that I would also add is that the floating approach is, um, it works best on certain songs where the chord changes are more or less diatonic or the harmonic rhythm isn't too fast. Harmonic rhythm is the rate at which the chords are changing. If we're talking about songs like Giant Steps or Moments Notice, it can be a bit hard to float over the changes while nailing the changes. When it's more or less diatonic or the harmonic rhythm is slow, it's easier to play across the bar lines, which is likely to happen since you're floating. On a song like Giant Steps, where it's changing keys all the time, and it's so not diatonic, you risk playing wrong notes, which may not necessarily be so bad depending on which notes you play or which notes you're emphasizing at any given moment. Basically, some songs are easier than others. Off the top of my head, My Shining Hour, Cherokee in particular, I think, are easier. Donnelly was not so bad, but there were a few moments that I felt were a little bit challenging. Again, also, it's up to you to choose how you interpret the changes. I remember when I was recording that solo for you, I, I wouldn't say I messed things up, but uh, it was in the moment, but over the second half when I started floating, I kind of didn't really clearly outline the F7, F7 chord. I don't remember what I played. Maybe it worked or maybe it didn't, but um, yeah, I didn't. I knew in my head, I was like, all right, I'm not going to actually nail the F7 chord, so I just focus on A flat and B flat 7. <laughs> So there you have it, the approaches to playing over super fast tempo songs. Um, playing in time, playing half time, and floating. And you can mix and match according to your tastes. And as I said in many of my previous videos, it's always going to be a spectrum and you have to choose where you want to fit in this spectrum. The only way to get really good at playing over fast tempos is to actually practice at fast tempos. Um, you may choose to completely ignore playing in tempo and just do half time or float like Louis Armstrong. And in which case, you actually don't need to be, you don't need to have virtuoso technique to be able to play over such tempos. But you still have to hone your time feel, your vocabulary, and your ears. Just because you choose not to play in tempo 
doesn't mean that it's going to be suddenly very easy. It's going to be easier in terms of technical difficulty, but there's still quite a number of challenges. And I've, like I said in the last week, I'm, I don't even consider myself an expert at playing over up-tempo songs. It, it depends on the tune. It's not something that I practice a lot because I'm a lot more interested in... Well, if it's going to be fast up-tempo, it's definitely not going to be 350 BPM. We're talking more like 260, 270, 280 maybe. Like I said, how often do you even play above 320 BPM anyway? The guitar is just not an ideal instrument for playing super fast bebop lines. So give it a try and let me know how it goes. By the way, if you go on DC Music School's website, there are free Gypsy Jazz play-alongs at uh, recorded at various tempos and you can actually manipulate the tempos to go even faster. So you can practice with those. And hopefully, maybe this year or next year, I'll release the straight ahead, straight ahead uh, jazz play-alongs. It's uh, a lot of work editing these play-alongs, but be patient. Anyway, leave a comment, subscribe, like, share, buy something on SoundSlice or DC Music School. Thank you, thank you, thank you.